Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Rezel, and I'm going to give a presentation on the subject of force degradation and naming it, breaking it down because one degrades in the process of force degradation and because it sounds cool. <laughs> now, uh, for my outline, I'd like to go over definitions, strategy, and stress treatments, guidelines and documentation, uh, designs, experiments, and data, and concluding remarks. A couple things about this talk. The scope will be drug substances, small molecule type, because that's what we work with at Regis. Also, this talk will not detail the topics of method development going into this type of work, as well as stability studies per se. So let's go with the definitions. Uh, the first one, of course, is force degradation, which is a procedure to create samples creating, containing relevant degradation products through stress treatments for the purpose of method development where the degradation products are anticipated to be seen in stability studies. So you do a worst case scenario, hopefully, to predict anything that might happen in real time stability studies. Sometimes, loosely, it's called stress testing. It's not the same thing as accelerated stability because that's a term used in stability study vernacular. And force DAG is required to develop a stability indicating method. I'll talk about that in a moment. Degradation products are impurities that are formed due to applied stress or what are seen in real time storage. And sometimes the term degradant is used for degradation products. A couple more definitions. A stability indicating method is a method having the specificity to reveal degradation products and separate them from the parent component. Usually this is done by HPLC, but it can also be done by GC and even thin layer chromatography. This can be the same or separate from the release method. It's ideal to have both stability and release methods be the same assay, but they can be different. And finally, a stability study, which is really not going to be the focus of the talk, but is the end game in all this work, is it is a protocol scheduled analyses or set of analyses to evaluate changes in impurity profiles under controlled storage conditions. And it requires a stability indicating method. So you need force degradation to get to the stability indicating method so you could do stability studies. On the next topic, it's about strategy and stress treatments. So generally speaking, what one does in these types of studies is to subject the material to various stress conditions and then determine the extent of degradation based on a decrease in the parent component response, which you will see by a chromatographic method. You want to target a general 2 to 30 percent range of degradation as an acceptable sample for use in method development. And, and using that sample for method development, this is what's going to get you toward a stability indicating assay. So I'll develop these points in the talk. Here's a list of stress treatments. Thermal, humidity, light, aqueous unbuffered or neutral, acid-based oxidative, and freeze-thaw. So it's a pretty big list. The top three generally are covered with solid samples or as-is materials, and the lower part generally pertains to solutions or suspensions. However, you can cross over as needed. The significance of having a target 2 to 30 percent is it's not a written in stone range, by the way. It's just a good approximation of how much you want to degrade your material when you subsequently decide you're going to use that sample for method development. So you can go higher if the degradation pattern is simple, and that is if just one or two peaks are formed. Or you might need to go lower if um, you're finding that you have a lot of little peaks due to nonspecific degradation. And finally, you might conclude that a material is so stable under a given stress condition that you can't really attain that target, but you tried as hard as you could. A couple of other definitions that um, are pertinent to this field are primary and secondary degradation products. So primary degradation products are what you, what you form when you degrade a sample, and these are the emerging deg products. And it's the type of degradation product you want to create in your sample from stress treatment. Secondary degradation peaks are what result from breakdown of primary degradation products. And typically, they're irrelevant and make the method development job unnecessarily more difficult. 
I just took this off of a, an online source. It's, it's a little funny how they say things, but degradation products and how you might find if you degrade too much or too little or just right. And what I like is the middle one. Predictive is when your degradation level is good, where one or more relevant degradation products are observed. Useless is when you overdegrade or maybe you degrade and put a lot of treatment into something and you're not actually seeing anything form. So what makes a method stability indicating? Well, degradation products must be separated from the parent component. A lot like release analysis where impurities must be separated from the parent component. I mentioned peak purity as an evaluation tool because not only do you want to look at your chromatogram and make sure you don't see peaks colluding, but you use peak purity as the devil's advocate approach to make sure you're not missing anything. Um, degradation products should be ideally separated from each other. Now that's the, that is ideal and sometimes it's not an easy thing to do. It is essential that you separate the parent from the deg products and ideally if you could separate the deg products from each other. The ideal method, as I mentioned here, it might be extremely difficult to attain. And a better use of time would be to look at what happens in real-time stability studies because usually the emergence of such peaks in real-time stability is a lot slower and you have time to figure out what's going on. And it might be necessary to adjust chromatographic conditions down the development path of a project. But you hope you don't have to do that. <clears throat> This is just a, a, an example chromatogram of where you show a blank at the top. In the middle is a control sample and at the bottom is a degraded sample. I'll get into a little bit more about chromatography and how you deal with data shortly. So I'm going to go over some of these stress treatments now. Uh, first is thermal stress and it's typically performed on solid samples. The mechanisms of degradation can be complex but I think it's fair to say where you have labile bonds that's where you're going to be affected. And it is most directly relevant to real-time stability studies. When you, when you look at stability study design, it covers different temperatures over time as well as humidity and sometimes light exposure. It depends on, again, the design. Thermal stress is additive with other stress treatments, simply meaning you might subject the sample to acid in solution type of treatment and you might go with ambient and a higher temperature. And you, you could exacerbate the stress of the acid due to heat. There's a, there's a model called the Arrhenius equation which can be used for fine-tuning degradation. I'll, I'll say more about that later, but it has to do with something every 10 degrees that you increase your exposure temperature, you can in theory double the degradation and, and you could play with that concept accordingly. Never fail to take advantage of DSC or thermographic and gravimetric analysis data that can reveal properties such as melting point, decomposition, and sublimation, which can influence your temperature limits. And you want to be careful that you know that sublimation is happening because generally speaking, when you degrade a sample, you want to account for degradation product peaks. And if you're subliming, your, your material is just going away and there's going to be a failure to get mass balance. So the next stress treatment to talk about is humidity. And I think we all know what that is. Um, it's, a, it's a key parameter in real-time stability studies, as I mentioned before. It's typically combined with thermal stress. And hydrolysis is the most likely mechanism of degradation. One can create high humidity environments for forced egg studies in a number of ways. You could use stability chambers, or you could create your own. I'll show that on the next slide. And consider the relevance of actually submerging your material in water. I mean, that's the ultimate humidity exposure. And, and it's valid and reasonable and scientifically sound. <clears throat> OK, saturated solutions. Um, I titled that slide accordingly because you want to create a microenvironment, let's say, for forced degradation. Uh, I like 55 degrees and 80% relative humidity. It seems to hit things just right, and it's easy to attain. So what we do is we use a typical oven that is set at 55 degrees, uh, we would have a control 55 sample, call it dry, sitting out here somewhere in a vial. And then for your humidity add-on, you would put the samples into a desiccator, which it's, it's not intuitive. A desiccator keeps things dry. In this case, we're just using it as a convenient chamber to put samples in. It's convenient also because there's a reservoir at the bottom where you could put in 
saturated salt solutions such as potassium chloride. This table is not intended to be read for its fine print, but it illustrates that these physical property tables exist where you can find a combination of salt and temperature and you'll get the desired humidity. So hence, saturated potassium chloride gives you 80% humidity at 55 degrees. And that's how you could stress a sample there. Now, I'm going to not get into heavy chemistry here, but acid and base stress typically deal with hydrolysis mechanisms. And some label bonds are described here. And when you look at oxidative stress, there are similar descriptions as to how hydrogen peroxide or other forms of oxidation can facilitate changes in your material. Uh, we typically work with hydrogen peroxide. I've always been anxious to try out um, hyperbaric or bubbling oxygen through samples, and that's something I'd like to do because that seems more close to home. But peroxide is really what the industry does do at the moment. Freeze thawing. It sounds like the least likely stress, but you know, it has more significance probably with macromolecules, and you think about proteins denaturing in solution. However, I could tell you from firsthand experience, I've seen freeze thawing affect a solid in terms of degradation. Never understood the mechanisms, and in fact, the chemists were baffled. This is a previous job, but um, just to say that um, you, you always want to consider the possibilities. And if nothing else, you cover all your bases when you're working with free stock, because it could be a condition of abuse uh, to a sample. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so then there's light exposure, also known as photostability or photolysis. And it's looking at the stability of your component as a function of light treatment. There are ICH requirements that uh, actually state what type of exposures you should have for both UV and visible ranges, and they're listed here. There are two guideline options for such exposures, and I wasn't really going to read them in detail except to say that we use a xenon lamp and we follow option one. What these do is they suggest a range or how to attain that range of wavelengths going from UV to the top of the visible spectrum. The Regis approach is that we use a photostability chamber. And this is sometimes talked about as a glorified light box with a timer. But it actually has a high intensity xenon lamp that covers the desired wavelength ranges. It is adjustable by time versus irradiance so that you can go with longer time, less irradiance, or the opposite, and you get your exposure because it's cumulative. And it's important to think about using a dark control in these chambers, although cooling is an option that we didn't happen to get for this, that chamber gets at about 40 degrees. And so one would just put in additionally a sample covered with foil, and there's your dark control. So you could tease out any thermal effects if needed. OK, suspensions and solutions and co-solvents. Uh, I, I had alluded to the um, concept of treating samples in a wet state or aqueous mode. And it's ideal to have solutions, of course. They're uniform, they're easy to reproduce. But if you can't get the solubility you want, you can work with suspensions. Now, since we're not really looking at kinetics and all that for force degradation studies, you're more or less trying to just get things to degrade, uh, suspensions really do have value. Samples, they should be d sufficiently dispersed and wetted, and then you can leave it there to be stored. If a molecule is prone, trust me, something's going to happen, OK? Material that doesn't dissolve, you put it in base, it changes dramatically and fast. Co-solvents can aid for solubility. Some people use them. I, I really disfavor them because they change what is the native system. This slide I did get just from an online source. I see what the industry likes to use. It's a laundry list of things you can add. But again, caution, because it does change what's going on. And if, for example, any of these things would react with your component, well, then you've got a new issue. You don't really want those add-ins to affect the study in a negative way. Appearance is quite important. Everyone's been told that, right? So um, it matters, too, in stability. It's not just dealing with numbers and you know, looking at a bunch of peaks. Our customers find value in our description of how samples look like after various treatments. 
because you never know down the line as you're looking at quality questions or even things like dissolution studies and drug product, how it's going to affect it. A stress treatment is going to affect the material. The important thing, though, is to keep mind of what does happen to a sample visually as well as numerically or chromatographically. One of the phenomena that can occur, and it's a very important, uh, it's very important to um, any drug developer, hence our customers, is this thing called deliquescence. Funny name that also can be synonymous with hygro hygroscopicity. And as humidity increases in the environment, material will take up water so much that it might take up water. So and what I'm going to do is I'll get back to more experimental. This I wanted to cover a little bit about sodium hydroxide. I bet everyone can relate to that there on really a humid isn't day. A lot if you out work there, with that specifically or with details like in this area. This is a very so unideal what is the ICH trait require? for any well, drug substance. I found three references, and shout out if anybody knows more than this that I'm going to show. But One A, Q1A talks about stability testing, where there's a general recommendation for performing four stick studies to be used in development of a stability indi indicating method. A very important concept, but it doesn't detail. Photostability testing is described in Q1B. There actually is a fair amount of detail in that guidance, but it is limited in scope to just light exposure. And then there's method validation, where there's a recommendation to use forced egg samples for proving specificity. And as FDI, FDA guidances are concerned, what I was able to find was a question and answer paper. So um, from I what I saw, there's not old, a lot of detail, that basically focuses but the industry on drug products and seems to have good found documentation. a common set of ways there to go is about degrading that samples. Stability if you go online, you look at forced degradation, specific, meaningful, and you'll find academic in this references. You'll also see section vendors that um, I'm citing. I should say, like analytical houses promoting how they do their forced degradation. And there's a lot of commonality. And what I'm about to show in the procedural part shortly um, is what you'll see often described. But a little bit more about documentation still. Uh, sometimes the questions ask, what about a protocol? Our clients sometimes ask us, what about a protocol? Is it required, not, by a, not in terms of regulatory agency terms, but it's wise to at least have a documented general practice in place. And we do have that. We do have it. I don't think it's that public. We share it with customers. It gives general information about how we perform our forced degradation studies. Some organizations may require a protocol, OK? So I know one customer that was adamant about us writing a protocol. And at the end of the day, so to speak, we said that that protocol will still need to have flexibility because this is an R&D exercise. This is a research and development exercise to get to where you make method development samples and then create a stability indicating method. So, the flexibility would have to be there. You can't write things in stone. And the last slide for this documentation piece is what about method validation? Some people ask if this is, if this is something you have to do in a validation. Well, whether to prepare and analyze samples or not for a validation depends on the organization and its procedures. Protocols could include degraded samples to verify specificity. In my opinion, and, and I a think couple generally of the industry generally have actually asked that we our customers agree it's not necessary sample. to repeat so an R and D study repeat as long as that study is well documented exercise and tracked. That we did and, and in I do development place some mode, credibility just for when I think of the purposes of our client base in because method they validation. know a lot and they in turn have their put a lot of thought into their, into their processes and procedures as well. So. Here we get into the design experiments and data.
You recognize the characters in the picture? OK. This slide basically reiterates what I was talking about in terms of stress treatments. So on the left covers drug substance, and on the right is drug product, which I said I won't cover much. And you have the different stress treatments here uh, for solids and solutions slash suspensions. And say and we have a control a condition for solids, design of what we, we do, we and these are, these are taken light. literally from um, our we MDS report. To heat, heat plus humidity. Our design and we go to a fairly high temperature of 120 degrees. And we cast a Once pretty again, wide net. It's if not you look always going to end up that way. Samples um, might over really degrade, and we have to redo here. some degradations in order to hit your targets. For aqueous, somewhat of a similar story. And I never fail to do that when using the pointer. But um, acid-based, neutral, oxidative, aqueous, and buffered, we have the typical media by which to do this, such as dilute acid, dilute base, phosphate buffer, for neutral and oxidative, dilute hydrogen peroxide, and various durations and temperatures to cover all our bases. I also like to expose samples to light in solution or suspension state, because sometimes you get an enhancement of what you might miss in the solid state. OK, so I try to drive the point that we have a plan, but sometimes plans don't go perfectly, and you may over-degrade or under-degrade. And there is an Arrhenius model assumption that says that for every 10 degrees increase, when you're working with solids the degradation and things rate start is to double. heat up in your charring and for your every samples, I don't think it's linear anymore. It's or logarithmic, yeah. or just you something can play else with going that on. in terms of it's very helpful to think the about this duration when you of time if you are want to over achieve what your sample you and you want to hit the target. And it works most of the time at reasonable temperature ranges. Just a gratuitous chromatogram or set of profiles showing what happens with thermal stress. At the top is a blank. Second from that is a control. And then you have um, increasing amounts of heat. And really, with a situation like this, by the way, you're getting somewhat of a nonspecific degradation pattern, although you are seeing some things emerge as majority peaks, if you will. what do we want peaks, to look at when we're making and all these degraded samples in this particular under sample, various stress I'll bet good money that the appearance okay. in turn black is that instead, instead you want to look maybe at change the color response a little bit, factor because you never want to work component. with charred samples. So forget Those degradation are pretty products useless for a minute. Hard to, you want to look uh, at your parent peak, anyhow. and you want to take that area count and divide it by the sample weight or concentration. So you can normalize everything. And then What I'm going to point to here in the control is you define that as 1.0, where everything else is compared to it. So in this particular set of data, one can see that the only appreciable change starts to happen 120 degrees for two days, where you lost about 0.45 or 45 percent. That's actually somewhat over-degraded, by the way. Okay, But it may still be a useful sample if your pattern isn't too complicated. You could do a similar thing for the aqueous samples as well. And what you get right away is an understanding that something is grossly bad or not so bad in terms of a condition for the material that you're working with. And I think we could agree to that. Much. You want to bad, do acknowledge your degradation looking at that products. one number. Now, I'm not and intending that people read this slide, else, but I, I want would people guess to appreciate that acid is the, pretty uh, the complexity harmful to this as well, call. or the, the amount of detail of how you we look into things. It when material has completely gone away, of course. And what you have here in terms of the columns is 
the, uh, the impurity that you see, and then the rows would be your different the stress treatments. The interesting thing happens when you're trying like to you achieve take mass balance, and slide you condense them shortly, into a table. But you'd like so to think you, that so when you write you a report, report, you should show chromatograms in terms of your like parent visual. But this do you is see 55 percent and, and it numerically remaining tells you how much oh, degradation did you get? I got that a little mixed up. If you lost 45 percent of your parent, do you see 45 percent showing up as a sum total of all your impurities? So that's something um, we want to keep in mind. But this could help you address whether or not you're getting good mass balance or you're not doing so. I did want to mention how long do you go on stress treatments. And I've kind of alluded to this throughout the talk. But you, you want to focus mostly on solid material stress treatments. So this is also about design and how you want to have the best path to getting where you need to get at, as fast as possible. So remember that the solid material wins here, OK? You're, you're really trying to support real-time stability where solid is exposed to heat, humidity, maybe light. Make the best effort possible to get degradation for thermal stress. If no degradation at 120 110 degrees, degrees by 7 days, 14 days, you likely can stop. 100 degrees, 28 days. Now, some people month. might say, kind of you got this, force okay. it, no matter what you do. And then uh, but there's two a point of reason. And if you Four think about this at radius, concept at 70, that I mentioned before, 120 months, 7 getting days, close to I'm a year. And I think you could imagine as you get to about 40 degrees, which is the top out temperature for typical stability studies, nothing's going to happen, OK? So you want to be careful. You want to justify it. But you're, you have to have a, a certain amount of reasonableness in how long you're going to cook a sample. Consider aqueous unbuffered stress as an extreme humidity exposure. Um, in case the 55 degree, 80% humidity design we use for seven days is not enough, if there's any skeptics that we didn't go to enough in an extreme, submerging your samples in water is certainly a valid way to get at it from the other side, so to speak. Stress for light at 1 to 2x the ICH limits. That is somewhat required based on the ICH guidance. And aqueous conditions typically view these as informational. I don't want to dismiss their importance, but generally for our world of drug substances, we don't have to have perfection on or around the aqueous conditions. We do develop our methods to cover all these, these bases, OK, all these treatments. And I just wanted to make the point that if you don't see any degradation by 55 degrees after two days, you could probably stop. I don't think you need to have acidic samples going for two months, stress treatment, at some higher temperature just to make it break down. And I think the industry generally supports that. What really matters? Real-time stability studies. Real-time degradation products are the impurities of interest and concern. We need to acknowledge the ICH limits for reporting ID and qualification, of course. And this figure just shows the arms of a stability study. Mass balance. Revisiting this from a few slides ago, uh, we need to have it. You, you, you like to have, you need to understand what's going on. And it would be ideal if you could see it all in your force degradation work, especially on the thermal and humidity exposure parts. Um, to get mass balance, it works off the assumption that all degradation products have the same response factor and that's as where you the need to consider component. orthogonal methods and that's for not evaluation. Always the case. But consider it's something also that the you'd idea like that if you heat happen. a sample and high enough we and it say contains it's a lot of solvents and a lot of it may water, be difficult you might for drive those well. up. And that products skew the mathematics as well. Where they give poor but response there should be awareness of mass balance. Never look like a deer in the headlights when this question comes up. Be ready to answer it.
There should be sufficient knowledge also, of the chemistry aware of what is formed ahead of time Some compounds so that degrade people can imagine the different degradation concern. pathways. So if in a real so time the stability, around every project you're should forming really a have this notorious mind. PGI an example, or there is an anti uh, tensile toxic impurity that actually forms um, hydrazine that's a problem, when degraded. Okay? So that is an issue for whoever owns that project. I'm going to show a few miscellaneous slides as I wind things down. So drug products and formulations. Although not the topic or highlight of this presentation, I'd like to mention that the general principles for drug products are similar to that for drug substances. But there are some other avenues to you, you have to address, like excipient drug interactions. One would also like to ferret and out often done what by is performing truly drug excipient compatibility studies versus what is API with interaction the with an excipient, excipient that you and think you're going to put into your formulation or with the sum total formulation alone and look for excipient. Uh, the this kind of study is actually even done products. for toxicology support. In in the world of preclinical, uh, most of the oral formulations are some kind of detergent like tween, I hate calling it a detergent, but it's a, and some kind of viscosity enhancer. And in, in other f feeding um, regimens, it's, it's like a diet admixture or a solid, solid mixture of rat chow with drug. And one should do in advance of that compatibility studies to see what might happen because people would like to change the cage food as least as possible and not have a stability issue confound the study that you're doing for tox. Parenterols, of course, um, are typically in vials. And one needs to acknowledge that uh, container closures can be an issue for stability because they can interact with your drug substance. They could leach or they could be extracted. Uh, by the way, leachables are what naturally comes out. Extractables are when you force the situation, so to speak, with perhaps accelerated conditions. This is my miscellaneous slide, which I uh, wanted to say, when you're thinking about stability, don't limit ourselves to just uh, chromatograms and appearance. Okay, there, there could be situations with microbial stability. Um, I, I got to say that's like really rare or never here, but um, it could it could be relevant. If you're working with macromolecules, 3D conformation, uh, certainly an enzyme um, can be affected over time. Appearance, as mentioned before, solubility could change. That's probably tied in with uh, other physical changes such as agglomeration or changes in polymorph, crystallinity, and the like. If you're working with polymers, your molecular size might be affected. So keep an open mind that this is more than just chromatograms and appearance and that in the world of drug development, it does go beyond drug substances. Here's a list of selected resources that uh, helped for this presentation, and uh, my concluding remarks are a couple of things. First, force degradation is an essential step in the drug development process, and such studies are required to develop stability indicating methods, and this is quite relevant here at our organization. Okay, so, so that, uh, I'd like to say thanks for listening, which and probably occurs I early in the project. Very happy the, to the idea of ideal impurities may be overkill, oh, maybe, thanks. and it becomes quite critical when you need to um, get into clinical studies where you have to either have qualified impurities or if they emerge in a real-time stability study, that's when you need to identify them. If you have a stability study going and you're looking at a trend of one month and three months and stuff is rising to the point of being close to that 0.1% magic number that you need to start thinking about identifying, then I think you need to be seriously concerned that that impurity is going to be even higher and it's, it's going to become a very urgent matter to get things identified and maybe even qualified with further tox work. Did that answer, Dan? Yes, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, hi, Suresh.
most degradation, you know, is this uh, related to the what what the bank happens in the balance of system now and then the plan goes from basic to the basic and then how far along can you related to that or partially. So um, so the question is, of course, you know, what happens in vivo or in the body? Is there anything you could get from these forced egg studies to apply there? And the answer is partially yes. I mean, we have to acknowledge that the forced egg conditions are relatively simple. They, they relate to kind of like external exposures, you know, environmental, maybe formulation issues, and, and some consideration of the very crude chemistry, such as acid in your gut and base in your in small intestine. But when it comes to metabolism, so many other things are at play. There are enzymes degrading. There's, there's liver metabolism, which really is enzymes again. And those will proceed by different mechanisms. There is a whole different separate field of metabolism where uh, drugs fate is tracked as a function of being broken down. And so one analyzes all the body fluids, you know, the blood, the urine, the feces and everything to look for, to track what's going on. Oftentimes radio label is used. Uh, mass spec is certainly a very important tool. And that degradation world is a lot more complex.